how do people react when you're angry at them? They get defensive. They don't want to help you. They see you as a violent person. You are trying to express a real pain that's inside you, but thanks to toxic masculinity, you're doing it in an angry way, and then everyone else, instead of helping you, just see you as a violent offender and want to shut you down. I'm thrilled to have today Simon Focht as a guest on my channel. I got to know him not long ago through a mutual friend here in Berlin. Simon has a PhD in philosophy and his passion of taking complex philosophical concepts out of the academic discourse and into the world. And today we're going to talk about toxic masculinity. Uh, welcome, Simon. Thank you for having me here, Moshe. Thanks. Yeah, let's start with the question, what is toxic masculinity? See, this is a surprisingly difficult question, actually, because we very often use the term toxic masculinity in a very kind of undefined, nebulous way, mostly to signal disapproval about something that we don't like about what men do. Um, and we kind of all know what it's about. We know that it um, has to do with men having to being too violent or not being able to express their emotions very well or perhaps other things in that, in that way. Um, but there's actually been research done about this in 2020. Harrington found out that out of most of the papers that have been published in the academic world about toxic masculinity, more than half of them didn't actually define it. They kind of relied on the shared understanding of what it is, that we all kind of know what it is. Um, but I think what's really interesting about toxic masculinity is that it is what we philosophers call a thick concept. Thick concepts are the sort of words that carry with them a value judgment. So, for example, when you say home or mother or something like this, those words feel good. There's something to them that they don't just like say this is a thing, like a chair or a table or something like this. They don't have this sort of value judgment with them, but home does. And similarly, toxic masculinity is a very laden concept that has this thick nature of signaling disapproval, signaling that there is something negative about it. And, and I think that it's... Um, has the effect of potentially getting men a bit defensive or getting men feel like they're being attacked or there's uh, that something is wrong with them and they need to, there's this undertone of something's wrong with you, you need to change. So you're basically saying it's not always useful to use the, this specific term and it might backfire in, in a sense. Yeah, I think unfortunately it sometimes does. I think that when people use it with the best intentions, they use it to say, what is going on is wrong, we need to change it, and you need to reflect about what you're doing. Effectively, people on the receiving end kind of just shut off. They just don't really listen. And I'm a pragmatist about things like this. I think that people sometimes get stuck on this principle of just like, we need to tell people the truth or say it how it is and all that. And I think we should really focus on just improving, on helping people improve. And if this kind of use of the term is effectively shutting down discussion and making people defensive, then it's not terribly useful. And I really like to think about toxic masculinity from this perspective that I've been developing that is based on um, the theory of virtues by Aristotle. So the great ancient philosopher Aristotle had this theory that every virtue, every good thing, such as, for example, courage, is flanked on two sides by two vices, the vice of deficiency on one side and the vice of excess on the other side. So if you're courageous, that's great, you're virtuous, but a deficiency of courage might be being craven, being afraid of anything, right? But there is also a possibility of having too much courage, and that's a vice of excess, and that means that you're jumping into any danger, any risk without any thought and all that, and that's being brazen, maybe. And I think that if we think about toxic masculinity as the sort of vice of excess of masculinity, kind of overdoing masculinity, doing it a bit too much, then it might be a bit more fruitful because then it might inspire men to think, hmm, maybe I'm trying to do something good, but I'm overdoing it. So for example, when you think of men being accused of toxic masculinity when they are not in tune with their emotions, or they are very kind of stoic and unemotional and all this, you can think of, well, that's overdoing it. 
But there is a virtue in that, right? Being in control of your emotions, being able to process your emotions and express them in a controlled way, that's a good thing. That's a virtue. And there would be a vice of deficiency as well when you're just controlled by your emotions, when you allow your emotions to be in charge. How does toxic masculinity affect boys and young men? And what are some long-term uh, consequences of socializing boys according to traditional gender roles? Um, for example, men should not show weakness. Um, men should not be like mm -hmm. a woman. Yeah, that's a great question. I'm really glad that you asked this question at the beginning because so often when people talk about toxic masculinity, they focus on how it affects everyone else except men or except straight cis men. Uh, because toxic masculinity today has been really so adopted by the feminist discourse that many people even forget that the term was actually coined by the uh, mythopoetic men's movement in the 80s, which was the kind of self-improvement movement for men. And it was very focused on how it affects men. And I think that today, so many men are really kind of lost and confused and as to what is their actual role in the modern society, because the world has changed massively over the last decades. And the truth is that many of the traditionally masculine traits or roles that we used to be performing, like being a protector or a provider and all this, just don't really have a space in the modern world. Women can provide for themselves perfectly well, and there are no Vikings raiding our villages around to, you know, for us to have to protect us, uh, people from. So I think that men so often are kind of lost as to what are we even for? And what they do is they start defining themselves not by who they are, but rather who they are not. So we are not like women. We are not like gay people. We are not, we don't do those things that women do. We don't do emotions because women do emotions and a manly thing is to not do that, right? And so often men would see themselves as this kind of like rough, roughly chiseled human with no frilly bits, you know? None of this like fancy schmancy stuff around. No, this is like the core and essence of a human. And, um, and that in effect means cutting off a lot of those, well, frilly bits that kind of make life really interesting and nice, such as emotions, for example. And I think that this effectively leads to men kind of shutting themselves in what many people have referred to as the man box. So this kind of constrained space of things and ways you're allowed to behave that kind of mean that you don't step a little bit outside of what it is to be a real man, because that would imply that maybe you're like them, you're a, like a woman, or you're like not straight enough or something like this. And it's a great shame because I think we can be so much more. Like what a shame it is for men to just go like, for, completely forgo all of those fantastic things they could be and instead close themselves in a box. I think toxic masculinity is really interesting to talk to in this specific context. How is it bad for men? Because it means that men just don't get to enjoy life to the same extent that they could if they didn't think of themselves in those very constrained ways. And I think there's one more way in which toxic masculinity is really bad for men. And that is that because we are taught to not engage with our emotions and not be able to express them, and that the manly thing to do is to react with anger to things, what we end up doing is we end up being unable to communicate the real problems that we sometimes have. Many men who are really lost right now kind of well, they suffer inside. They suffer from their loneliness. They suffer from various other emotional and mental problems. And they are unable to say that. And when they do say it, they express it with anger. And what happens when people hear this? How do people react when you're angry at them? They get defensive. They don't want to help you. They see you as a violent person who is, you know, being horrible. You are trying to express a real pain that's inside you, but Thanks to toxic masculinity, you're doing it in an angry way. And then everyone else, instead of helping you, instead of seeing you as someone who needs their support, just see you as a violent offender and want to shut you down. Yeah, I've recently came across this publication that could uh, clearly correlate that men that mm -hmm. have a sense of defensiveness mm -hmm. around their uh, masculinity tend to have also more um, sexual problems like erection dysfunctions. Huh, so, really?
so yeah, that, that was a recent publication in um, 2023 by Walter and co-authors. And it shows that even in a physical body, there's um, effects to putting ourselves mm -hmm. as men under such pressure. I think this also ties nicely with the, the Aristotelian framework that I was trying to spend before. Because when you are in this sort of situation, when you feel like your masculinity is being questioned, and you know, sexual prowess is definitely a thing that men feel like is important to being a man. If you feel like this is in danger, what are you going to do? You're going to overact, try to compensate somewhere else. You're going to try to prove how much of a man you are in other aspects of masculinity, right? And what do you end up doing? Well, you end up overdoing it, which is exactly, there's something like right in the middle that you could have been doing, but you end up overdoing it. How does toxic masculinity intersect with other forms of oppressions, such as racism, homophobia, transphobia, um, and how do these intersections impact marginalized communities? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that this plays into what I was saying a moment ago as well, which is that because men define themselves as what they're not, insofar as they define themselves like this, they define themselves as, well, we're not gay, we're not trans, we're not like those people. And therefore, they have this heightened need to prove that they're not like this, which exhibits itself in, once again, overdoing it and overdoing masculinity and effectively becoming toxic in the ways that I was describing. And it's really weird because we so often describe the gay and the trans people as the confused ones, but that's not true at all. They actually sat down and they have done the thinking about what is their sexual orientation? Who are they? How, are they? How do they want to project their gender and stuff like this? It's the cis men who haven't done this. If anyone is confused in here, it's the men who have never thought about these sort of things and just play from the script. They just do what the culture tells them they should do. I would encourage everyone to basically try and actually think about this, and men in particular. And because there's two ways in which men end up reacting to these sort of things. And unfortunately, they do it, well, they do it to prove their masculinity, to once again show like we're not like those people. And there's two ways in which you can do it. You can work on yourself and become better. And this way you prove I'm a great person. Fantastic. But you can also increase the relative distance of power and of mm, dominance and things like this between yourself and others by pushing others down. You can lift yourself up. That would be a fantastic way to you know, profess your masculinity and profess your strength and everything. But if you do this by pushing others down, you kind of seems like get the same effect. You're higher up than them. But it harms other people. And it's a horrible way to do this. And Definitely, I can connect to that charge that is sometimes there in relation to needing to put down. Uh, right. Yeah. I mean, I, I can talk about my own experience. I had some situations with my father growing up where I was so surprised um, asking for certain things and him responding, no, I would rather not doing that. Mm -hmm. And me kind of as, as a young boy expressing that I'm sad or starting to cry. And suddenly there was a switch and he would look at me in those furious eyes and he would say, why are you crying like a baby? So, so that, right. that kind of trigger, that kind of need not to be in that specific way can be very strong. It's unfortunate. And I have my own experiences of a similar kind. And it's really interesting. I've just been rereading The Will to Change by Bell Hooks, fantastic work from a great second wave feminist. And she writes about how shocking it is that men have this need to put others down, even if they're their own children. Like a father would do that to his own son to, well, effectively also position himself as the stronger one in here, as the one who knows what's right, as the one who is in power, right? How messed up is it that we would be doing that to our own kids? Why do you think so many men deny from the beginning that toxic masculinity exists? Yeah, I, it's, you see it all the time, right? I mean, Jordan Peterson is raving about this and so many other influencers as well. And I can see an obvious reason for this. I mean, nobody likes being accused of being bad. And like I mentioned at the beginning, toxic masculinity being a thick concept that carries this negative judgment, 
nobody likes being judged negatively, so they're going to say whatever they need to defend themselves. But I think there's also a potentially more interesting reason, and that is that we started using the term to signal people's individual moral failings. The focus of the term is very much on the individual. Something is wrong with you. The way the term was coined originally, and I think would be potentially more fruitful to use it, was more to focus about the reasons why you are the way you are. There are some causes. You know, so often people act in a way that is angry or violent because they are actually afraid or they suffer or they act something out. There is a really valuable way of approaching this by asking not what is wrong with you, the individual responsibility approach, but rather what made you be the way you are? Why are you be what are you struggling with? What is the cause that is making you, to, making you act out in such a toxic way? And I think that potentially if we focus on those things, men would be a bit more receptive as well because they would think of themselves as I'm trying to be a good person, it's just a lot of crap that I'm dealing with and I'm dealing with it badly and I could learn to deal with it better. And that's a very different story to feeling like everyone thinks that I am essentially a bad person. Yeah, so basically the difference between a personal and a systematic collective um, problem. Absolutely. And the story that you brought up with your dad would be a great example of this, but I imagine this wouldn't be the only time in your childhood that you heard that boys don't cry. It would be a message that you've seen in every film, right? That's a message that would have been repeated in many social interactions and things like this. And this is pretty much a definition of this being a systemic problem and not a problem with an individual. And I think a systemic problem is in need of systemic solutions. What role can women play in challenging toxic masculinity and how can they support men in breaking free from some harmful gender behaviors? Yeah, that's a difficult question because you don't want to put too many requirements on people who are also victims of toxic masculinity and we can't expect women to do men's work for them. Men should challenge their own toxic masculinity. But I think it is really quite important that women also support us in this. And I think typically when you want to change someone's behavior, you've got two methods. You've got the carrot and you've got the stick. And I think that right now the stick is used a lot. But I would really want to encourage women to just take heed of the fact that we know from countless psychology research that carrots are always much more effective than the sticks. People respond to positive incentives much better than they do to negative incentives. And there are so many positive things that women can do. Women can vote with their feet. They can basically really promote and showcase and like inspire the people who are actually quite wholesome and not the men who are not toxic. Just like, I don't know, reward them for the things that they are doing. And that reward doesn't mean what many people instantly think about, right? Like have relationships with them, have sex with them or something like this. No, like invite them to things, tell your friends about them, give praise to them, give, you know, talk about them at events, give various others kind of social incentives that just make those men feel like, huh, that's kind of nice, actually. I, I will do more of that thing. And I think one of the main reasons why men are so potentially toxic, especially with respect to not being able to communicate and share their emotions, is that nobody taught them. When I was growing up, do you think anyone taught me how to express my emotions? I did a lot of work on myself in my 20s to actually learn the emotional intelligence that everyone says men should have. Well, where are the men supposed to have it from if nobody teaches them? So I think that women shouldn't feel like it's their responsibility to teach men any of this, but I know how much it helped me that my partners were there for me and they did actually help me develop all of those emotional um, intelligence that I was lacking before. Yeah, I love that you're talking about the teaching element. I remember one of my partners quite often asked me, so are you saying this because you are thinking about your side or is this a real attempt to try to find a win-win solution? Are you feeling into us as a, mm -hmm. as, a, as a couple, as a relationship? And it really made me think and, and reevaluate some, some of the ways I was moving, operating. So definitely there's a big potential in women mm -hmm. collaborating with men in a way of 
teaching. Absolutely. And I think so often, I mean, we know from psychology that very often we're just not aware of what's going behind the hood. We're reacting to things without having thought this through properly. And um, um, so often we could use this help of someone who draws our attention to those things using nonviolent communication, for example, drawing our attention to the fact that we are reacting to something else that is making us feel afraid. Or maybe we're acting violently because actually we're afraid of something. And that means, once again, that would, it would kind of draw attention to those causes of toxicity rather than like blaming you. And once again, it would show that like, you're overdoing something. You're doing something wrong, but actually you're trying to do the right thing. It's just you're overdoing it. And someone on the outside who is there to draw your attention to this and help you see it, invaluable. Can you give an example of an alternative masculinity model an example for how in a different culture or an historical context it was dealt in a different way and what do you think we can learn from that yeah great i mean there's plenty of examples both from the real world and from the fictional world i mean people bring up gandhi or they might bring up i know michael phelps recently the great swimmer has been really i think open about his mental health issues and things like that showcasing how not to be toxic. And um, there's great fictional examples. I mean, Ted Lasso or, I don't know, Argon. But I think I really like to focus on one because so many men right now who are, can be quite toxic think of themselves as very stoic and think of stoicism as this kind of being detached from your emotions. And the fun thing is that one of the greatest stoics that they like to quote, Marcus Aurelius, was, was nothing like that basically. And he's, I think, a fantastic example of a great role model for men who don't want to be toxic. A little bit of history. He was a uh, Roman emperor, uh, and uh, he was very influenced by the school of philosophy called Stoicism. And um, in his um, life and in his rule, he always tried to better himself. He always tried to become a better person. He always tried to become a bit more like his adoptive brother and his predecessor, Antoninus Pius. Uh, but basically, he was always open to improvement. And he wrote his greatest work, The Meditations, as a kind of personal journal. A personal journal in which he was showing how he is dealing with some problems and becoming better. And one of the greatest problems that he was dealing with was his emotions. And he was very open about the fact that he had anger issues starting on and he struggled with expressing his emotions and he was learning to do this and the meditations are an account of him doing that. So not only was he really open to improvement and acknowledging his faults and wanting to become a better person, but also he was very open about his emotions and he was very clear that the stoic thing to do, the stoic with a capital S, the way the ancients understood it, is not that you hide your emotions, that you pretend you don't have them. You feel your emotions, you allow them to come through to you, you listen to them, but then you master them. You control them and you are in charge of your emotions. And I think these are great two things at least that we can learn from Marcus Aurelius. Improve yourself and allow your emotions, but also control them. So how can we shift the paradigm about what is a real man? How can parents, educators, mentors foster a more healthy attitude toward masculinity? What are some strategies that can be implemented to encourage emotional diversity, uh, vulnerability, mm -hmm. um, empathy, interest in gender equality? I've been pointing towards some things at least that I think would be important. So use more carrots than sticks, like I said before. Encourage people by platforming good examples. Make it seem like becoming this is great. It's going to give you people's respect. It's going to give you people's admiration. It's going to give you social success. It's going to make people think well of you. Create a society or create your social groups in such a way that people are rewarded for their wholesome masculinity and not rewarded for their toxic masculinity. Unfortunately, there are still so many systems in our society that reward people for being toxic. Promote jobs in health, education, administration, learning, these sort of more traditionally associated with femininity jobs. Promote them to men. 
why is it that we have so many scholarships for women in STEM disciplines, so in science, technology, uh, engineering, and mathematics, but we don't have any scholarships or very few scholarships for men who want to work in education, for men who want to work in uh, literature, for example. And similarly, the, you know, we should just ensure that the kind of jobs that use those skills, the you know, emotional intelligence skills and all that, are just attractive jobs. They're well-paid jobs. They're respected jobs. They're the kind of things that people go like, yeah, that's something to aspire to. Rather than the jobs that pay the best are the ones that are the most toxic. You know, the ones in which you fire people and, I don't know, are the most ruthlessly efficient CEO. So I think there's these two things, really. Those, those kind of more personal things in which we can encourage people just by giving them positive reinforcement. And they're institutional in which we send this message that those things are valuable. So let's say you're telling yourself, well, maybe there is something there for me to look into. What kind of resources or support networks are available for those seeking to unlearn harmful gender norms? Yeah, it's um, quite unfortunate that there aren't many enough. There are not nearly many enough. I think that there are some things you can try on your own. And I would most encourage people to follow a recommendation of another great Greek philosopher, Socrates, who said that we should all try to know ourselves. Know thyself was this like dictum that was written on top of the Delphic Oracle in Greece. And basically it was encouraging everyone to really think, what is it that I want? Who am I? Why am I acting the way I am acting? And it's such a shame that men are so rarely doing it. But there's also many things that you can do or many support networks that you can access from the outside. So many circles of men or groups of men have been forming around the world uh, and they tend to gather the sort of men who exactly want to do that work, who have sat down at some point and thought, huh, who do I want to be? And maybe if you're in a group of these sort of men, there is an opportunity to actually you know, cross-pollinate ideas, express how you're feeling about something and hear how other people are feeling about it. What do they think about their own masculinity? Maybe it will inspire you. And it's really funny how men are so cagey about their emotions very often. But if you get in a circle of men like this and just one person says something that is a bit more revealing, suddenly the floodgates open and everyone wants to talk about their problems and all that. And no wonder because so many men really do struggle and suffer inside these days, and they really are confused, and we do need other people to talk about these sort of things with. So join a man circle. I think that's a great, um, great thing to do. Yeah, I can say from my experience. I've been oh, right. running some men's group for like six years now, mm -hmm. and it's amazing to see what kind of uh, self-reflection process I mean, like you said, finding those things inside yourself is very empowering, is uplifting. I think that it's also useful to just kind of try new things. Or maybe like try to do something that's a bit unmanly, you know, just to try it and see what it's like. I don't know, join a dance class, go to a yoga retreat or something like this, right? Or start painting or, or other things like this. A great way to kind of give yourself an opportunity to go like, hey, what are all of those things? that I have always been denying myself access to. Maybe they're actually quite fun. Yeah, thank you very much, Simon. I think it was really inspiring. And maybe you can just share how people can find you. Fantastic. Thanks very much again for inviting me. It's been a great discussion. And if anyone wants to find me, then you can go online and just type in simonfox.org. You'll find my website. Or you can just search for my name on YouTube, on Medium, on Substack, on TikTok, Instagram, pretty much everywhere and feel free to just get in touch directly.